Considering how much time people spend in their vehicles, it's surprising how little we think about the risks of being in this confined space, often alone and easily distracted. Our streets are getting more dangerous, so it's time to map out a vehicle safety plan with ConcealedCarry.com's Jacob Paulson and Riley Bowman, and Concealed Carry Magazine's Kevin Michalowski. Watch this special broadcast and learn these important self-defense strategies. Recognizing attempts to get you out of your vehicle and into a vulnerable position. How to carry and fight from a car. Using your car as cover. Escaping a mob, carjacker, or road rager. Don't miss this discussion that drives home the need for situational awareness and safety behind the wheel. At the USCCA, we're taking Safer at Home to the next level with our $20,000 Ultimate Home Defense Makeover. Join now and you could win a full home preparedness audit with expert Jason Speller. This prize package also includes a security system, emergency supplies, training, and more. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to your special USCCA broadcast. I'm Kevin Michalowski, Executive Editor of Concealed Carry Magazine, and we are joined today to talk about vehicle defense tactics with Jacob Paulson and Riley Bowman from ConcealedCarry.com. Guys, you have made a great video. I really enjoyed watching it, and we want to talk about defending yourself from a vehicle, so thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having us. Oh, uh, this I, I think this is going to be a really good and timely conversation right now, and, and I really want to jump right into it. People have been seeing it on the news. Um, they understand a lot of the protests and different things that are going on, um, protests that sometimes spiral out of control into riots. We'll, we'll call it what it is. And when, when people are driving, let, let's get right to it. What's the best way to be carrying a firearm and be ready to protect yourself? Yeah, the, the key, I think, step one here is have a firearm and ideally have it on you. Uh, what we see a lot of common mistakes is people will have a different type of carry set up in the vehicle. And so that, you know, defeats all those, you know, trained muscle memory type responses if they have to access that firearm from a different place in the car. So step one is have it with you. And step two is probably carry it in the same way you always do. Just your normal uh, daily loadout, you can bring that right into the car with you. Riley, what do you suggest for the best way to carry and access your gun when you're in the car? Well, there's obviously a variety of ways we could go. My preferred method is I, I carry appendix, and I carry in the appendix position all the time. Uh, the vehicle is actually, a, it makes a very strong case for that appendix position because it's always accessible, and it's also the most defensible position as far as if we were to have somebody breach the vehicle and start attacking us inside the vehicle, I can defend that that front you know abdominal abdominal area uh as about as good as i can defend anything mm -hmm. and and i've noticed that i'm a four o'clock carrier I, I carry on on my strong side hip and for me to access right. my my handgun in a vehicle i'm leaning way far forward and and struggling a little bit with where my seat belt is 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 connected you know where the the lap belt and shoulder harness connects to, uh, to the the base point on the floor um, any good ideas for for training to to get through this or, or ideas to get access to the gun and, and um, you know let, let's uh, go with you Jacob we'll, we'll start there um, what's the best way to learn to do this stuff one would be I think it's important that we don't try and change up our carry when we're in the car I said that earlier so if you carry it four o'clock Kevin then when you're in the car you need to uh, practice and figure out how you're gonna access that gun at four o'clock if you do and, and a lot of carriers do carry four or five o'clock maybe even three o'clock strong side then you need to get really comfortable and familiar with what that's gonna require if you do have to lean away then you might be able to grab the steering wheel and almost pull your body uh, away from the firearm to expose that and make it easier to draw uh, rarely does a person actually need to disengage the seatbelt in order to access the firearm. Now, obviously, the seatbelt might need to be disengaged in order to bail out of the vehicle if, if that's what this comes to. But if we're going right to the gun because we think we're in the middle of the gunfight, we need to solve a problem, then I wouldn't worry about the seatbelt. I'd just figure out how to uh, you know, position the body so you can get to the firearm. Uh, now, obviously, if you do carry about you know, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock on the body, that does going to that does mean you're going to have to telestrate a little bit, right? Some, someone who's really paying attention and watching you is going to be able to tell you're doing something. You're moving, you're reaching for something. And so all 
also figuring out how to minimize your movements so that you don't over lean, so you're not over, you know, really communicating to, to any observer what you're doing. That's going to be helpful. And this really comes down to just some dry fire practice, just taking uh, a clear unloaded gun, maybe with a barrel block or maybe a training uh, pistol and getting in the car and just playing around with this from your carry position to figure out what it looks like and how it feels for you. Yeah, I think that's absolutely a, an outstanding point. It's something that we've got to practice. Riley, I'm going to come over to you a little bit and, and talk about, you know, maybe the concept of um, pre-staging. I mean, typically, unless it's a, a, you know, completely surprise attack, you might know that something's going to go bad. Um, are we suggesting maybe getting that, that pistol out into maybe a firing grip or maybe in your hand and down below the line of sight or something like that? Um, it, it, is that something you would consider wise or a good option um, if, if you think trouble is, is on the horizon? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a valid technique that if you are, you know, reasonably sure that there's going to some you know something is going to be going down then getting the firearm staged and ready to go in a safe position ideally maybe between the legs uh, where it's not really visible uh, but it's in your hand finger of course off the trigger uh, and you can bring it up in an instant if you had to I also believe in uh, when we get in the vehicle of, of sort of pre-staging and, and making sure that our clothing and everything is set up in a way that allows quick access to the farm as well. So I'll get in and I'll actually, uh, you know, prepare my, my shirt, uh, either making sure that it's not going to get caught up in the seat belt. Uh, in the appendix position, I actually just pull up my shirt from behind the belt and drape it over the belt. Or sometimes you can also, and this would work for three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, where you can kind of bring the shirt up and maybe tuck it behind the firearm uh, so that it's not really visible while you're sitting in the vehicle, but you don't have to deal with clearing a garment out of the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, that people need to understand and, and talk about is that especially if you're in a vehicle, you might be driving away from trouble. Um, if you're going to drive, drive. If you're going to shoot, shoot, that kind of thing. Um, make sure that, right. that you have control of either the vehicle or the firearm um, when, when you're operating that sort of stuff. And it, uh, there, there's lots of things to think about just from, from the, the base position of, of where you're fighting from. And maybe that uh, leads us into another topic is, what sort of things, let's get, you know, just the average day. Let's say that, you know, America is not going crazy with protests and riots and things like that. What sort of things should people be on the lookout for? Uh, you know, how do people attack folks in vehicles? How does that typically happen? I think there's a couple things we have to consider. First and foremost, understanding that from a legal perspective, we don't have, almost without exception, we don't have a right to defend our vehicle, a piece of property, right? We have to, we have to keep in context of this, and we talk about vehicle defense tactics, that what we're defending is the humans. We're defending ourselves sitting in the car, the child in the back seat, uh, the friend who's in the passenger seat. So it's the people that are defendable, uh, not the piece of property. And and so with that in, in context, I think, you know, if we're trying to understand how does someone get a Attacked. What does it look like uh, when I'm on the roadway? A couple considerations. One, you know, we're talking about the riots and some of those things right now. If someone starts bashing on the hood with a crowbar, starts banging in a, a, a window, we have to be really clear about what you know what we're defending. You know, if, if this is going to escalate to a point where I'm going to be personally in jeopardy. Then, then I might need to take action. But if somebody's putting dents in my hood, then we need to bear in mind that's that's just dents in a hood, the car's insured, and we should probably be cautious. But there's a lot of techniques today uh, that people use in order to attack someone in a car. You know what's really difficult to do is to attack someone or to gain access to their vehicle while it's moving. So keeping the vehicle moving to the best of one's ability is a really sure way to make sure that you're not a threat. And so probably priority number one, if you think that there's a concern, is to escape with the vehicle. The vehicle, uh, you're going to be far better off and more likely to survive if you escape with the vehicle. Uh, number two is maybe use the vehicle as a weapon. We forget that the, you know, we're in a massive, huge, heavy metal thing. And when it hits people, it hurts. So sometimes more effective than going to the gun is using the vehicle as, as the weapon itself. Um, but generally, you know, people people are not fools, and they know that when you're sitting in a, in a, in a seat, like a bucket seat in a car, you're going to have a challenge really understanding, seeing all your surroundings. You have mirrors and things, but if you have an attack that comes to you from behind, think about the way a law enforcement officer approaches a vehicle. They're very particular, and they're very cautious, and they're well-trained to ensure that they maximize their position, right, their tactical position. And so if, you know, 
you get bumped, you know, and you think that you're in a car accident and you start reaching for insurance. This is a common technique someone might employ to get you to exit the vehicle and then an accomplice can jump into the car and take it or attack you or do whatever needs to be done. So situational awareness, which is something, of course, we talk about all the time, becomes all that much more important when we're in the vehicle because we have limited uh, peripheral vision. We have limited uh, access in terms of being able to p pivot and deal with different threats in our environment. So we really got to be on our game in those situations and remember what, what it is we're defending. Absolutely. Um, Riley, give me some of your insights, um, what you're thinking about you know, accessing, um, maybe even uh, let's talk a little bit about possible shooting positions if you have to fire from your vehicle. Right. You know, and actually, just to kind of add to Jacob's comments there really quick, he's exactly right that if the first thing we can do is consider evading or escaping the situation, it's so, so, so key. Uh, one thing I just wanted to add to what he already offered is that we want to be cautious about pulling right up behind other vehicles. So maintaining you know enough of a distance there so we can maneuver around other vehicles uh, gives us additional options as well. Because if we can keep moving, that's always, I think, the, burst, uh, the best first uh, case scenario. Uh, as far as... <clears throat> different shooting positions from, from within the vehicle. We have to understand that obviously a vehicle is a confined space, but there's still opportunities there to put ourselves into an effective firing position. A lot of what this usually entails is actually positioning ourselves in the body, uh, leaning and, and twisting and turning as we need to, to better address the threats. So if I had a threat to my left or to my right side, I can actually physically twist and turn my hips, my body, using my legs as leverage down on the floorboards and actually pivoting my entire body is that that's going to be the best way to you know get a two-handed firing grip on the gun get it right up in my eyesight and uh and, and address the threat that way um, naturally there may be times where we may not have that opportunity we may need to consider firing one-handed so making sure our one-handed shooting skills are top-notch not a bad idea either and I, I think it's very important to stress um what both of you mentioned um not only avoidance, that situational awareness, and I really like the uh, the fact, uh, Riley, that you pointed out, don't pull up right behind a car at a stoplight, you know, leave some space in case you need to drive away, something like that. It, it's something I say when we're talking to everyone about self-defense is, is all the self-defense rules and laws still apply. You still have to be facing an imminent deadly threat when you're using gunfire, and you have to understand uh, where where your castle doctrine laws, if they apply to you in your vehicle, in your state. So um, th this is a time where I always tell people, you know, go to uscca.com slash laws and make sure you understand where your vehicle, you know, how you can defend yourself and your family and your loved ones in, from inside a vehicle and what, what's the most effective way to do that. And I, I like the idea of, of driving away and getting out of there, but Remember that vehicle, like you said, um, Jacob, is, is a weapon and you could be looked at as using deadly force to escape a situation where maybe you, you didn't have to, uh, but I, I would much rather get out of there safely and alive and then deal with that situation afterwards. Um, is, it, uh, is it something that, that people should learn some more defensive driving skills um, before they go to their handgun or, or, or is it, you know, when we're looking at a situation and wow, things are going bad. You know, what's the first option? And give people maybe a little checklist. You know, um, avoidance, and and then you know, escape and things like that. How? And then finally, we go to fighting. Um, what are what are the ways we want people to look at this? Um, in I guess we'd call it a continuum. I kind of hate to use that word, but mm -hmm. you know, what should people do first? I'll preface with this, and then I'll kind of give you a four-step guideline. But the, the preface is understanding that a vehicle is a really bad place to be in a gunfight. Mm -hmm. We need to just accept up front that you don't want to be sitting in the driver's seat taking gunfire. You can't get away from the shots. You don't have any decent cover. Your movement is limited. It's not a good place to be. So we got to recognize that while a lot of this topic and this conversation centers around this idea of, you know, while seated in a vehicle, I'm going to you know draw a gun and, and place good shots or return fire. That's a real super duper last last ditch uh, you know defense. It's really not a good situation to be in. So you know when we look at it, as we kind of prepare our curriculum around vehicle firearm tactics, we look at it in kind of these four steps. Step one, escape with the vehicle if possible. Vehicles move, they move fast. If the vehicle is not disabled and you have a clear and safe avenue of escape, take it every single time. Uh, it's going to be your best odds of survival. 
If that's not an option, maybe you're boxed in, maybe the vehicle is disabled for whatever reason, uh, use the vehicle as a weapon if possible. So maybe I can't perfectly escape the situation, uh, but maybe I can turn the vehicle into my attacker or I can do something to use the vehicle to my advantage as a weapon. If that's not an option, my third best option is to bail out, is to get out of the vehicle. Uh, on the exterior of the vehicle, using the vehicle as a piece of uh, cover, I'm gonna be much more successful and increase my odds of surviving the fight significantly over me just sitting in the vehicle where I'm effectively in a gun magnet. I'm in a closed box where I can't move with relatively no cover, uh, only cover really from one direction, right? The engine block. So a, a, a vehicle is just not a good place to be. So escape with vehicle if possible, use vehicle with as weapon if necessary, third bail out. And then fourth real kind of thing is, is, is sort of, a, well, initiate gunfight and then bail out, right? We always got to understand that if, if I'm going to go to the gun, then my long-term objective has still got to be escape. It got to be getting out of the bullet magnet. And so if I'm going to use the gun, either I'm going to do that and then I'm going to bail out, or I'm going to do that and then I'm going to drive away. Uh, but the, the, the end all here cannot be the gun while in the vehicle. The, the gun's going to allow me to bail out or the gun's going to allow me to escape. Uh, but the gun is not the end objective. We really got to look at it in terms of escape, Use vehicle as weapon, number two. Three, bail out. Number four, shoot and then bail out. Yeah, I always like or to escape. tell people that the, the, the end result of, of any self-defense incident should be that you're causing enough dysfunction in your attacker to allow you to escape. That end result is that escape. And I didn't mean to cut you off there, uh, Riley. Um, what were you going to add? Oh, I, I just was adding to, to, to the end of those four priorities as we teach them. Uh, uh, use the uh, bailout. Or use the gun from within the vehicle and then escape. Yeah, that was uh, he. He was spot on with that. We teach those as the four priorities of vehicle defense, uh, and approaching it in that way is is I think the best approach. Of course, everything is situationally and context dependent. So we got to weigh our options. We got to look at the circumstances of the situation we are in, and apply the best tactics that we can. But always with the idea of of preventing that attack or that threat from being a threat to our life and getting away from the situation. So spot on, gentlemen. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, talking a little bit about the the uh, um, ability to escape with the vehicle. Um, but, you know, I, I tell people all the time, drive your vehicle where you can drive your vehicle. Um, is that the advice that you guys are giving folks? I mean, you know, jump the curb, run through the bushes, you know, whatever it is you're going to need to do to get your vehicle out of there? Absolutely. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, you know, any potential property damage I would cause is going to be a worse consequence than sitting in a vehicle taking fire or having someone trying to yank me out of the car uh, because they, you know, f for you know, putting putting my own life at risk. You know, we got to look at everything related to defense, whether with a gun or otherwise, in the sense of minimizing risk, right? What is what is the thing I can do that dr brings my physical risk down as close to zero as possible? And so in this case, yeah, I mean, if I if I've given myself enough distance from the car in front of me, you know, or maybe there's no car in front of me, and the you know, if I turn left, I'm going to go into incoming traffic, perhaps. I'm boxed in on the back by my attacker. Then if I go right. And that's going to put me into the into the shoulder or up on the curb or you know running through a bush or whatever like move on like go for it and, and i think having some sense for um you know what your vehicle is capable of doing too i mean the average vehicle is going to plow through a bush without too much trouble um depending on the bush and you know whether how much clearance you have and some of those things but but yeah i, I think that the answer is always minimize my physical risk as close to zero as possible absolutely riley anything to add on that one well, yeah, just uh, to make sure you understand the limitations uh, and the constraints of your vehicle. I mean, if you're in some little tiny car, that obviously changes things compared to, you know, driving a Toyota Tacoma, which is Jacob's uh, pickup of choice. Uh, so that, you know, the vehicle will give you additional uh, options or limitations. And so understanding what those are. Uh, defensive driving tactics is so key. I mean, we saw recently a video, I think it was actually out of uh, the Denver area here, where an individual was going down a street, realized there was a bunch of protesters blocking the end of the street. And uh, some of those protesters were getting rather rather violent in, in some instances, uh, rather than take some kind of evasive maneuver and try to U-turn and get that vehicle flipped around and go the other direction, they just continued on their path. They were committed to that course of action. So don't think that we have to be committed to a course of action. I'll tell you, if it's putting myself at risk, I have no problem if I'm on a one-way street or on a freeway, uh, as long as I'm not putting 
you know, or increasing risk substantially for any other human life, I have no problem turning around going against tra uh, traffic or against a one-way street if that means escaping a potentially violent or deadly encounter. Yeah, I think the idea of a traffic citation, you know, a moving citation is is a better option than uh, than even being involved in a fight, much less worrying about whether you're going to win the fight. If you can avoid that, you know, get yourself out of there and, and keep moving. Um, what about uh, vehicle choice? What would you guys suggest? I know that we talked a little bit about Jacob's choice of, of pickup truck. Um, when, we're, when we're looking at something like this, do you have a, I guess, best case scenario? What sort of vehicle is, is the easiest to fight from? I'm going to assume the biggest. Um, you know, that's going to get you through the most things and give you a better vantage point, stuff like that. But, but if, if people are selecting a vehicle that's, that's easy or more difficult to defend, any options out there? What are you, what are you thinking? I, I think you're exactly right. I, I like the biggest vehicle I can probably reasonably drive <laughs> or afford. Uh, Jake yeah. and I both drive pickups. Mine's a little bit bigger than his. Uh, you know, I, I, I would prefer that certainly over a, a you know a small uh, you know two door car or whatever. So, mm -hmm. uh, but obviously people got to drive what makes them happy or what what they like or what works best for their particular circumstances. But just understand the limitations of your vehicle. And uh, to that point, you know, as far as hopping curbs, driving through bushes or whatever, uh, you, you know, know what you you can do and what you can get away with because disabling your vehicle uh, because you crashed into something or tried to hop something that you couldn't or getting high centered somewhere that's that's not doing the job of getting you out of the situation. Yeah. I'll, I'll add this thought too, that there's there's a lot of little variables that you don't think about. For example, you might watch some of our training content or you might take a vehicle uh, firearm related class uh, somewhere on a range. And, and traditionally at those in those kind of scenarios or when we're filming video, we use the junky old cars we can because we know we're going to shoot them up. Well, junky old cars tend to have very low clearance. So if, if then one day you're involved in some sort of incident and you're driving a big pickup truck, you're going to be really shocked to find out that you have very little concealment under the underneath that vehicle because you were practicing or you were watching that training video online with a vehicle that had about six inches clearance off the ground, and now you're running you know around your your F250 or F350 and you got like a foot of clearance, and so you have zero concealment from your attacker on the other side. So the, I think the key here is in addition to knowing the you know the constraints of your vehicle, also just doing some of that dry fire, just taking taking the you know this might mean going in the middle of nowhere. Maybe you got a big garage or workshop you can park in and just kind of getting a sense for, okay, not just how am I going to fight from within the vehicle, and that's certainly important, but also how am I going to fight around this vehicle, and how does that change based on these little things like, oh, I got this massive engine block in this big truck, that's fantastic, but I have a ton of clearance, which could be an advantage or a disadvantage, I just need to recognize that's different in my vehicle than maybe this other one uh, that was used in the class I took or in these, in these videos that I watched when I was getting this training. Um, do you guys, and, and this is something I probably should know, but uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll put the question uh, forward to you. Uh, when we're talking about um, if you have to escape your vehicle and get out of your vehicle, um, tactics or tips for people getting their, I guess, partners, getting the, the folks who are with them, getting kids out of the vehicle, and then um, I know it's going to be based on the context and what's going on around there and, and the circumstances. Where are you suggesting people go once they m get out of their vehicle? Yeah, um, well, first so I'll, of all, I'll people... I'll take about half that, then I'll pass the other half to Riley. Sorry, Riley. So the, the first thought is there um, just some quick thoughts about the actual bailout, and then we can talk about... Um, you know, getting other, I'll let Riley talk about getting other people out of the vehicle. But the, the general idea if, if, if of the bailout is to fortify one's position, to get to a better position. We, we're accepting, we're acknowledging that staying in the vehicle is a bad position. And so then the objective is to get to a better position, a more fortified position of, of cover. Uh, and, and the other idea is to uh, be proactive in the fight, to determine what the angle of fire is going to be. Um, if this is a gunfight and I'm taking fire, by bailing out, uh, I'm effectively taking the fire away from the vehicle. If I have other people in the vehicle, then hopefully that fire is going to follow me as I continue in to engage the shooter or the threat. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Riley touch a little bit more on that. I guess here's, here would be my first thought. Uh, you, you're probably familiar with this idea of using the V, right? When we when we exit the vehicle, we create this kind of V between the door uh, and, and the 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 A-frame of the vehicle. 
and it's common uh, practice to use that A-frame as a, a fortified position uh, as a transitionary space as we're bailing out of the vehicle and getting into a better position to cover. Uh, I think most people who are watching this are probably familiar with the mythology of Hollywood that you know, do, gun, you know guns and, and gunfire go through car doors. But what people may not understand is the concept of deflection, that by keeping the car door at an angle, I increase the odds that a bullet can effectively, I, I hate to use the word skip because that creates the wrong visual, but effectively deflect at an angle off of that door, door uh, such that it doesn't penetrate fully at a perfect angle and, and come through. So when you bail out, um, if you need a transitionary space to continue to fire as you exit the vehicle, uh, keeping that door at, at, at its greatest angle as possible to your shooter and shooting through the V is a good thing. And we've done tests where we've had the A-frame of the vehicle stop bullets. At least twice uh, we've seen that happen. Uh, so you, you know, you, leveraging those that that A-frame of the vehicle and keeping the the door of the of the uh, of the car at an angle to maximize the odds of deflection are good tactics. Then obviously moving to the next most fortified position to cover. Yeah, so with uh, bailing out of the vehicle, uh, particularly if I have occupants in the vehicle, passengers, um, if I have passengers with me, that reinforces even more how big a priority is for me to try to escape or evade with the vehicle. Uh, because being in a fight with other passengers in the vehicle is not an ideal situation at all, especially if those passengers are younger or not particularly capable of defending or fighting for themselves. We also need to recognize that uh, uh, people need to be willing and, and understanding that you may need to climb over seats and climb over stuff uh, because you want to exit the vehicle from the side that, that, that the threat is not on. Uh, so, uh, you know, if that means me as a father needing to get my, my kids out of the back seat uh, I want to keep that vehicle as much as possible between me and my threat and, and try to get those, those individuals, those family members out of whatever side is opposite from, from that threat. Jacob is exactly right that this is one of the reasons why, again, everything's so situationally dependent. If I made the determination that we are in a fight for our lives and there is maybe even incoming fire into the vehicle, uh, I, I'll likely be a more effective fighter, assuming I can't drive away from outside the vehicle, using more of the vehicle as effective cover. Uh, so, and then as Jacob mentioned, you, you know, that's going to hopefully take that threat further and further away from those people that I care about. So uh, that's exactly one of the reasons why one of the priorities is to get out of that vehicle and engage in that fight if that's what we determine is necessary for the situation. Uh, and so the, the other thing is too, anytime we're uh, exiting or bailing out of the vehicle and we may need to use our, our own verbal commands uh, as we are instructing passengers to stay low, to get down. Uh, and, and that's true for us as we are getting out of the vehicle and trying to use it for cover, whether we're shooting through the V uh, as, J as Jacob was just talking about. Uh, again, very temporary form of cover in that case. Uh, uh, but ideally I wanna be getting out of the vehicle low and away from those vulnerable areas of the vehicle as quickly as possible. Uh, if my threat is to the front, I want to get out low and to the rear of the vehicle as fast as I can. Uh, we want to put as much of that vehicle between us and them. If the vehicle, if the threat's to the side, I want to get out, down, and ideally, uh, you know, we got to go to wherever we, wherever is effective for us to fight from. But ideally, if I can get down and low, uh, bet uh, where that engine block is between me and my threat, that's where I want to be. So. And then we also don't want to stay totally locked in on the idea that my only form of cover, my only place I can fight from is the vehicle itself. It may be, you know, this is exactly why we want to be situationally aware and paying attention to our environment because we may recognize that, hey, there's a, a, a Jersey barrier. For instance, we're on a freeway or a highway. If I can get over that Jersey barrier, I'd much rather use concrete than my vehicle as cover. If I can get my my passengers, my family members, whatever, onto the other side of some kind of form of cover, then that's that's going to be my priority is to get to that place of safety, staying low and moving quickly. Absolutely, I, I'm going to you know not to not to dispute, but just something that uh, um, that popped up here and and ended up with a, 
um, actually a couple of different people uh, being out of law enforcement as a result of that, that the Jersey barrier thing is always a look before you leap option. Uh, we had a state trooper who was trying to cross a couple lanes of highway, uh, vaulted over the Jersey barrier, not realizing that he was on a bridge and, and there was two barriers and he went right down between two sections of bridge and, and uh, broke both his legs and his pelvis and stuff like that. So um, I'm all for moving only to better cover, but make sure you know where you're going and, and take a good look at it. You know, um, uh, identify where you're going to be jumping into before you jump over the top of something like that, especially on a roadway or, or anything there, because you don't really know what you're going to be getting into. You might be going down a, uh, a really steep embankment. You know, great, you're away from the gunfire, but now you're bouncing down, and, and you might lose your firearm as a result of it. You know, um, well, let's let's get to the brass tacks now. People want to talk about shooting from a vehicle. That's uh, you know, I've been to a couple of different courses, and everybody's always excited about it until they do it for the first time, and then they realize what's going on inside that car when you fire a gun. Um, uh, I'll start with you, Riley. Uh, we're, we're talking about from shooting inside a vehicle. What do people need to consider when they pull out their gun, put their finger on the trigger, and their sights on the target? What are they going to be dealing with? Yeah. First of all, uh, it's going to be extremely loud. It, it, it'll probably be shocking to you even the first time you experience it. So just be aware of that, at least know ahead of time that that's what to expect. Plus, there's going to be a lot of particles of glass and things flying around as well. And you may not notice that in the heat of the moment, but just be aware. You may come away with 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 glass in your eyes, with uh, uh, fragments and things that have you know, come in, uh, that have uh, injured your face, your skin, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, as far as shooting out of the vehicle and trying to get effective hits on our target or our threat, uh, we need to be aware that if we're shooting through glass, that glass is, it may be clear, it may not seem like much, but it actually will have quite the effect on your rounds, particularly that uh, laminated, rather thick glass of your windshield going to have and it's it's sitting at an angle so bullets just like water just like electricity try to take the easiest path as they are passing through an object so what the, the easiest path is the shortest distance uh, so we have to look at that glass and realize that if as we're sitting inside the vehicle and that glass is sloping away from us uh, where the bottom is further away right then as that bullet goes through it's going to try to turn upward as that bullet takes the shortest path through that material so recognizing that as we shoot a threat through through a window like that, particularly a sloped window, that round is going to turn upward, and our our hits are going to be higher than we than we expect. Uh, then, assuming that we have the option and our threat is not particularly moving very much, as much as we can put rounds through that same area, that same hole that we've just made through that glass, that's going to be our best uh, way of of ensuring that those succeeding rounds are going to go through uh, and and go where we want them to go. Jacob, what would you like to add about shooting from inside a vehicle? Yeah, glass is very unpredictable. You know, from from testing, what Riley and I would tell you is that, you know, you, you have about a 90% chance of, uh, you know, having done this, if you've done this a lot or if you've seen the training videos, you have about a 90% chance of being able to predict to some certainty that, yeah, you know, shooting from inside through a windshield, you're probably going to deflect upward at some, some angle, 5, 10, 15%. But about 10% of the time, it's just not going to do that. It's going to do something completely weird and different and wonky. And so to Riley's point, punch a hole and then shoot through that hole as much as possible. I guess what I would add is that the side side windows are nothing like the windshield. They're generally made from a different type of glass. You may or may not have tint on them or built into them from the manufacturer. And so they're much more likely to give the kind of the traditional spider web effect. Uh, you fire a round or two through those and whoop, you know, they just they spider web and now you've lost all visibility. So it's it's probably a best practice, especially if this is a, a window that's right next to me, if it's on the side of the of the vehicle I'm sitting on, uh, you might need to punch out that glass. Maybe you put the first round through it, it spider webs, and now you're using the muzzle of the gun uh, to break out at least enough hole to you know, get your visibility back and obviously uh, to be able to continue to fire rounds now through a hole so that you have no deflection or, or no change in trajectory of that bullet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and w when we're looking at, uh, at, at, at fighting from a vehicle, uh, Obviously, uh, like I said before, you know, all, all the, uh, the typical rules apply, you know, for the use of self-defense. Um, what other things should people consider? Uh, we're, we're talking about having them, you know, get away if they can, um, get out of the vehicle, you know, if the shooting starts, you don't want to be trapped in there. Um, uh, give us some, some other tips, something, something else that people need to pay attention to um, when they're, I'm going to call it trapped in a vehicle or they're in a vehicle and, and a situation arises. 
Uh, I'll, I'll go first just because uh, I'm, I'm that kind of guy. So I have two thoughts that I think are probably really worth mentioning that we didn't talk about. First is that your legs uh, become really awkwardly positioned to get muzzled by your gun. So the first time you go sit in the car and you're doing some dry fire practice and you're working on your draw, almost without noticing it, you'll probably muzzle your legs a few times. So especially if you're drawing from that traditional three, four, five o'clock position and you bring that gun up, when you're in a standing position and you kind of move that fire arm around the side of your body and up into kind of a center of chest for for a, for a straight extension to target uh, when you're standing that's fine there's nothing dangerous about that but that exact same kind of draw movement when you're seated means that you're probably muzzling your legs and that's not cool so you, there might be some just simple tweaks that you need to make to your draw to kind of sweep the muzzle over your legs to ensure that you don't muzzle them. And, and that's, that's a slight, you know, that's a tweak to your, your draw stroke that's important to keep in mind when you're seated. Uh, again, this is probably where the appendix position really shines is in the seated position because I come straight. Uh, out of the out of the holster between the legs, and then I can come into the the next position. My second thought, and then I'll pass it over to Riley, is that uh, a, a place we see a lot of people get get messed up in the vehicle is they want to push the gun out. They want to do that full extension out to target with their with their elbows locked, like you would imagine in your head, and then they want to move the gun within the vehicle. When the gun's already extended like that, your your odds of running into objects are increased dramatically. Running it into the steering wheel or or the you know the seat or whatever it might be, and so you probably want to not do that. Probably an ideal scenario is to bring the gun up into like a high compressed ready type of position, center of chest, and then orient the body like Riley talked about earlier, really pivoting the body, turning at the waist, trying to the best of your ability to square your chest with the target and then push that gun straight out and extend to target. And that's going to ensure or at least minimize the odds of you running that gun into another object. And, and that's something you have to deal with. And, and the more you do dry fire and the more you think about you sit in that, that car seat and you're in your garage and you have your training gun or whatever it might be and you think to myself, well, if, if my threat's over here, how am I going to get to that? Oh, if I turn like this, I, I can't shoot two-handed. And if I extend all the way, I'm going to run into this, this window. So I'm going to have to do something like this. The more you practice and think through those things in advance, that's the, the greatest thing you could do. Yeah. Uh, I'll uh, take it away from there, Jacob. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, I, that high compressed ready position is 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 a very valuable position when we're in a confined space in a vehicle like that, uh, because from that point we can go any direction we need to. So it's all about getting the gun from the holster to that position safely, uh, particularly if you're coming from the hip or behind the hip uh, in your draw there then you really got to be mindful of the tendency is to swing that, that muzzle of the gun right across your thigh. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's uh, something we want to try to avoid. So getting the gun up and around and up into that high compress ready and from there pushing out to wherever our threat is that we need to address. Watching for the steering wheel in particular, another thing to watch for, uh, that, that can sometimes impede your your draw or as you try to transition from one area to another area as far as addressing a threat uh watching for things like get you know causing malfunction with your gun now typically you're going to be shooting uh from a little bit different and more awkward of a position than what you're accustomed to and maybe when you're typically training on a square range you don't normally have a lot of malfunctions or problems with your gun running but when we start changing the angles of our wrists and our arms and we're shooting in weird positions and maybe our grip's not as ideal as it is just be aware of that and be prepared uh, that if a malfunction occurs that you're prepared to to deal with that malfunction getting it the gun cleared and, and back to running again uh, making sure that on recoil you don't bounce down into say something like the steering wheel and that might cause your gun to go out of bat battery or interrupt it cycling and and that sort of thing so we want to try to avoid those uh, internal environmental things uh you know as much as we can also being aware of your other passengers if they if they're present in your vehicle uh probably the natural reaction for a lot of people if assuming this is some kind of gunfight uh when gunfire starts coming in most people are going to duck low that's ideal that's actually a good thing for us if we want to try to return fire but if we're teaching or training or preparing our our passengers or family members or spouse uh, partner or whatever uh it's not a bad idea to say hey yeah if this goes down you just get down low get down low get out of the way uh, and, and if i got to respond with my own uh, return fire then i want everybody low and out of the way so i don't so i'm not concerned about shooting them accidentally in the process 
Yeah, I can imagine that uh, trigger finger discipline is something, especially in a confined space like that, that is just uh, going to be absolutely mandatory as we're uh, as we're rolling through some of this stuff. Which leads me to the question about training and and getting quote unquote ready for something like this. Uh, I don't imagine that a whole lot of people. Yeah, you can you can go um, do the dry fire in your garage or, or something of that nature. You know, to to move around in your vehicle. But do you have any training tips? For folks who might want to do this in a in a live fire version, maybe on a range, should people be on their range, maybe practicing shooting from the retention position, you know, with the with the gun near the high center chest, high compressed ready, um, or uh, obviously shooting with one hand um, and shooting with one hand maybe either direction. Um, what tips do you have for people who want to shoot some live fire that might transfer over to fighting from a vehicle? Yeah. I'll, I'll simply say that there are classes out there you can take. They're generally on the more expensive end, and you may have to travel because there's a handful of academies out there that, that offer some sort of vehicle, firearm-related uh, training class. But that might be something to put on your on your training schedule and on your horizon and say that's something that's really important to me. I commute a lot or I drive a lot or whatever, and so I want to make sure I'm prepared in that kind of scenario. There are definitely things you're just not going to get from, like as you said, kind of dry fire, maneuvering around the vehicle in the garage. Uh, understanding deflection truly seeing and, and, and understanding how deflection works on metal um, is something that you really need to understand, uh, whether that's you know buying a training video or, or finding some free video on YouTube or something. Uh, but you re really understanding that is something I don't think you can get from dry fire manipulation. Um, the proper use of cover generally and certainly how a vehicle is used as cover uh how, you know how to not crowd the cover to maximize your odds of, of leveraging deflection and and also being able to uh, move and and do what's necessary to maintain a tactical advantage those are things that i think are very difficult to get in that environment you know until you've seen deflection and how that works until you've uh, been in some sort of like force on force scenario or some sort of you know training where you're forced to use that vehicle as proper cover to not crowd it and to maintain a position uh, of a tactical advantage i think those are things you just really are not going to be able to get so i think getting to a live class or you know maybe second best consuming video training content where you really see what that looks like and you understand how it applies in the gunfight is, is not really replaceable. So, so look for a class. Riley, you got yeah. anything to add on, on something like that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's, there's some things that I think that a, a more skilled individual might consider doing at the range or at least consider doing with, uh, another watchful eye or instructor watching over you. But we can actually practice a lot of the same shooting techniques, assuming that we uh, imagine ourselves in a position where we have to fight from within the vehicle. Uh, we can set up a chair at the range and practice. And I always encourage doing it dry first, even when we're at the range, you know, unloading and clearing that, that gun and, and then doing some dry runs. Uh, but practicing and feeling and getting kind of a sense of what it feels like to actually draw from that seated, slightly reclined. Most of us don't sit in our vehicles, you know, in a 90 degree angle, you know, straight up and down seat. Uh, so maybe setting up like a, like a, like a camping chair or a lawn chair or, or just sitting on a stool, but kind of imitating what that's like, uh, that slight recline and, and getting familiar with drawing from where it is you choose to carry your gun and then orienting yourself to a target at the front. You can actually turn that same chair sideways and get familiar with the idea of drawing, doing so safely, and then twisting and turning and orienting myself to a target to my left or to my right or, or that sort of thing. So there's, there's some opportunities there to get some repetitions uh, from some of those kind of less standard or compromised shooting positions. Yeah, and I, I want to go back to something that Jacob said over there is, is understanding really what happens when bullets meet vehicles. And uh, I, I've uh, put some of the uh, fellow officers that I work with um, through training, and we've got some uh, derelict vehicles, and we shot through them. And, and guys were shocked to find out that uh, on the same car door, um, different areas in the car door, some would stop bullets completely, others would just go whistling right through and, and come through both sides. And when we finally you know, pulled off the interior panels and took a look at the door, every vehicle is different. And we could not count on one vehicle 
Um, you know, we could never say, car door is covered, it's going to stop a bullet. Well, it might. It might deflect it. It might just let it whistle right on through. And um, it, there, was, there was great differences in location between um, 9 millimeter rounds, 40 and 45 rounds, and, and shotgun slugs just sort of went through everything that we were shooting when we were out there. So um, the, a very valuable opportunity if you get the chance to shoot around vehicles or, or witness vehicles um, being fired upon and see what, what happens with the bullets in there because it, it's truly eye-opening. And uh, when I first explained to some of the cops that I work with that th they thought they were going to shoot through the windshield at somebody at the hood of their car, um, almost nobody could hit that guy with the first two or three shots. Um, we had to go, you know, be shooting through that hole. Um, the deflection and the elevation we got from those rounds, um, the rounds went high every single time and, and uh, it was pretty eye-opening. Um, it was counterintuitive to what some people thought when we were when we were first doing that sort of thing. So um, let's let's shift to about um, uh, you know kind of quickly here on what other things should people be carrying with them in the vehicle? Get home bag, a, a go bag, something like that. Um, what should we be doing? Um, you know, and and I guess we'll sort of wrap up this whole discussion about that on preparedness in general um, when you. Because we spend a lot of time in our cars, you know. Typically, we're we're there back and forth to work, and we're taking the family places and things like that. I'll mention the most obvious one to me, and Riley will have some other fun insights. But I think you need a trauma kit. Uh, the odds of you pulling up on a car accident where you can administer medical uh, attention or medical first aid to an injured person are significantly higher than you ever needing to draw that gun in the car. So having a trauma kit is definitely important. Uh, as mentioned, the odds are higher to need it, but bear in mind, if you ever do need the gun in the car, you're definitely going to need a trauma kit. So having a good trauma kit and obviously the training to use and apply those tools, uh, things like tourniquets and chest seals and pressure bandages, I think that's of the utmost importance. So having a quality trauma kit from a reputable company with genuine uh, materials and components in that kit is A number one for me. Uh, the trauma kit, man, that's huge. I was just going to say, I, I have personally, as a not on duty so a non LEO situation. I have pulled, I've been on the scene of three different accidents, uh, serious accidents. People, you know, bleeding, people hurt, bones sticking out, that kind of thing. So uh, that is so true. What Jacob just said, having that kind of trauma kit, those sorts of uh, tools handy, uh, very, very, very valuable. Uh, having light, uh, light is absolutely essential. Uh, whether it's a weapon amount of light, but especially having flashlights. I like having a flashlight on my person. Uh, that's important for obviously low light situations, whether that's identifying what's going on, whether that's identifying a threat, whether that's helping with some kind of emergency that I come up, up on the scene or just fixing my car in the middle of the night, which I've been there, done that as well. So Having light, having other emergency uh, tools at your disposal, have, having uh, uh, placards or, or, or uh, flares or that sort of thing, uh, all of that can be very, very useful. Um, having extra water on hand, blankets, uh, the, that sort of thing for the more prepared, mi you know, preparedness-minded individual, uh, all not a bad thing to consider as well. Uh, communications. I, I actually am a ham radio operator. Jacob is as well. Uh, having a radio in my vehicle that can actually be another form of communication where maybe I'm in a in an area where I don't have good cell service, uh, and but maybe I can reach somebody on a radio. So all kinds of uh, things we consider as far as just keeping ourselves safe and, and, and ready for anything when we're on the road. Well, that sounds great. And uh, guys, well, we're going to wrap it up here. I really want to thank you for being here, uh, sharing some of your insights. Um, folks can uh, check out your sites, concealedcarry.com, and take a look at, at what's going on over there and, uh, and learn a little bit more. But any final points, tips, anything that you want to close out with before we go? We, we appreciate uh, Kevin you sharing our website and looking for, you know, I would encourage people to look for our training there. I guess my final thoughts would be uh, take action. I think you probably are a person who watches these videos a lot. USCCA puts out so much great and amazing training content. But are you the, a person who watches these videos and says, that's a great idea, I'll do something one day? Uh, I hope not. Pick one thing from this this training that you've heard today, one thing you can do better on, and I'm, I'm going to do this too. Pick one thing and say, you know what, that's something I can improve on. Maybe you've never done any dry fire in your vehicle. Maybe you you need to take a class in a vehicle. Maybe you need to go take a stop the bleed course or go buy a trauma kit. But pick one thing today, even if it's nothing more than getting your ham radio license like, like Riley mentioned. Just please pick something and put that on your I'm going to go do it list and get it scheduled and go work toward that goal now. Yeah.
I 100% support that. Uh, uh, the, my goal is to never settle for mediocrity, you know, just being happy with status quo. I'm always pushing to uh, get to that next level, whatever that next level is. So, so pick something, do something. Uh, honestly, I think a, a person should plan to take at least one good quality uh, firearm training course every year. Uh, you know, more is better, but a lot of times a lot of shooters don't even get a single class in a year. So set it on the, you know, set a date on the calendar, say, I'm going to go on this date. I'm going to take this class. I'm going to make that happen. Whether that's this month, next month, six months from now, or within the, the coming year, just do something, make it happen, make yourself in some way better today than you were yesterday. Well, thank you again very much, guys. I'm going to take this opportunity to remind everybody, too, that, you know, uscca.com is an outstanding resource. And even if you're not a member right now, get over there to that website and check it out. We have all sorts of education, training, and, of course, our members get that legal protection and lots of extra member-only benefits and things like that. This truly is a lifestyle, and this is the opportunity. You know, I, I tell people the chances are pretty low that you might be involved in a gunfight, but the stakes are really, really high. And you have to do everything correctly because first you got to win the fight and then you have to deal with the aftermath of all of this stuff afterwards. And it's so very important. And I want to thank you guys both for being here, taking the time to help us out, talk with us about these vehicle tactics. Um, and again, I'm going to, to mention, so everybody's watching, you guys put together a great video series on, on, on training tactics, on uh, the vehicle tactics. I really enjoyed watching that. So thank you very much. And uh, for everyone's watching, this has been your special USCCA broadcast. I'm Kevin Michalowski, editor of Concealed Carry Magazine. I want to thank our special guests, again, Jacob Paulson and Riley Bowman from ConcealedCarry.com. You guys stay safe out there. At the USCCA, we're taking Safer at Home to the next level with our $20,000 Ultimate Home Defense Makeover. Join now and you could win a full home preparedness audit with expert Jason Speller. This prize package also includes a security system, emergency supplies, training, and more. 